Great. Thank you. And good afternoon. My name is Phil Greenwald. I'm the um, with the City of Longmont and Boulder County. Uh, I'm also the Vice Chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. Sarah is not able to make it to this meeting. Send out our best to her. I, I think she's uh, been injured in some way, so we're putting out some um, good thoughts her way that she gets well soon. So, uh, Sarah, if you're listening, uh, get well. <laughs> we want to see you next month. Um, I call to order the January 23rd, 2023 Dr. Cog Tech meeting. This in-person live stream meeting format, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute, unmute themselves, and share their webcam. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. Please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please raise the hand, please use the raise the hand feature to ask any questions or comments on the agenda items. And as a reminder to members and alternates, please make sure the light on your microphone is on when you're prepared to speak. And please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. And be sure to say your name every time you speak so they can record who's speaking and, and what's going on for the summary. Um, at this time, members attending in person will introduce themselves. Um, Bryce Hammerton, City and County of Broomfield, um, alternate for Sarah Grant. Jeff Tankenbring, representing Arapahoe County from the City of Centennial. Matt Kellison, uh, Arapahoe County, City of Aurora, alternate. Alex Hydright, Boulder County. Kevin Ash, Weld County, Town of Frederick. David Spados, Regional Air Quality Council. Jessica Micklebust, CDOT Region 1. George Hawker, then Aviation Special Interest. Kent Mormon, Adams County, Thornton. Deborah Basket, Jefferson County, City of Westminster. Am Kennedy, Dr. Cog. Greenwald, City of Longmont. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog, staff. And Pat Stork, Dr. Cog. Bill Soroy, RTD. Uh, Justin Schmitz, representing Douglas County, City of Lone Tree. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Josh Schwank, Dr. Cog, staff. Carson Priest, TDM, not motorized seat. Jennifer Bartlett, City and County of Denver. Rick Pilgrim, environmental interest. Brian Weimer, Rappo County. Thank you very much. So with public comment, we're gonna open the public comment now. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. It will call on you by the last three digits of your phone. Staff will unmute you, and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, please, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. Now we open the public comment. Anyone out there wishing to speak? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll give it a second just to see if we have any questions at this time. I don't see any, thank you. Cool. Um, so from the December 19th, 2022 tech meeting summary, is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about that meeting and that summary? There are none, uh, that means that the minutes are approved and no action is needed, so we'll move on to the item, which is um, number four, fiscal year 2022 through 2025 transportation improvement program amendments by Josh Schwink. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have six proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program for TAC this afternoon. Uh, the first two on your list are um, federal formula funds that RTD receives through the Federal Transit Administration. FTA has informed RTD of um, a revised formula funding information, and so these are just to add that information into the TIP. The next project for the I-270 corridor is to add a state faster bridge funding, uh, specifically for bridge design along the corridor. Uh, next, we have the State Highway 7 and 95th Street intersection. Uh, this is just a one-for-one -one swap in funding from state regional priority project, or RPP funding, to state legislative transit funding. So no change in funding, just a change in uh, funding type. Next, we have a new pool being added to the TIP for Vision Zero safety projects within Region 1. Um, and finally, uh, we have a new project for I-25 Segment 5. This project is actually currently listed in the TIP as part of the RPP pool for Region 4. Uh, it's just breaking that out into its own separate project and changing the funding to state legislative. Um, so happy to take any questions on any of these. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you in your packets. Questions for Mr. Schwenk? Deborah. I'll make the motion. To recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached project amendments to the 2022-2025 TIP. Right. So is there a second? Ken? Uh, Tim Mormon, a uh, second. Um, with that, following everything, is there any more conversation or any discussion on the item after the second? Let's vote. All in those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And passes. Next item on the agenda is Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan Approval, and Greg McKinnon will be giving that update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Am I okay now? I have to stand closer than I thought. Um, this is a, uh, something that will be familiar to you. We uh, uh, introduced uh, the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan uh, in December. And um, uh, as a reminder, it is a, an effort to um, uh, guide the uh, development and deployment of technology, uh, the purpose of, of assisting and improving the multimodal day-to-day uh, -day operations in the region to uh, meet all of our customers. Um, and it's also going to be guiding the upcoming call for projects for this set-aside uh, fund, the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology set-aside. The, uh, the, the Starting off here with the summary from last time, it's, uh, you know, real-time data is essential to the operations to make sure that we are uh, uh, safe, efficient, and reliable in providing uh, trans, uh, transportation operations in the region. Uh, the, the, uh, all the operations need to be uh, collaborative and integrated. Uh, and uh, we also like to recognize or point out that technology is a tool and not the solution. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is provide assistance for our operations uh, staff and facilities to be able to do their job better. Um, and at the same time, we have to recognize that the capabilities and needs of each of the jurisdictions in our region uh, vary as well, so we have to be able to accommodate that. Uh, and then overall, we need uh, regional management for some of the, the solutions to be able to uh, adequately address them. And, and as an example, uh, you know, the Dr. Cog has been uh, providing uh, transportation operations support services and signal timing uh, for decades. Uh, with the, you know, it's been acknowledged in this plan that that's going to evolve from the way that we've been doing it before uh, to providing uh, new services that are, are needed by the, the local agencies and other partners. So the document has a, a number of initiatives identified grouped into three groups. The first group is foundational, primary, uh, in that it's, uh, these are the required elements that to support uh, all the other operations that are identified in the other initiatives. So we have a situational awareness platform identified, and I'll go in, in the next slide to provide a little bit more explanation about that. 
but it's being able to bring together uh, the information that's available for the operators so that they could do their job better. Uh, and that includes the camera control sharing or sharing of video images between jurisdictions um, and expanding uh, the data that's being collected in the network so that we're filling in gaps uh, where uh, there currently isn't uh, information. A performance measures data platform uh, brings together all the data from, uh, from historical sources and real-time sources so that we're able to uh, develop strategies and processes to uh, continue to be efficient and reliable in our, in our operations. Uh, and the last two here identified are ongoing activities, the traffic incident management uh, program led by uh, CDOT and the Colorado State Patrol are you know, developing instead of standard operating procedures for uh, the improved operations uh, in dealing with incidents and also uh, transit signal priority optimization procedures, uh, integrating the operations of traffic signals and the uh, uh, transit management system. So this is a, an illustration of the, um, the, the platforms that I was talking about. The situational awareness platform is the data that's necessary for operations and emergency staff to be able to take action to uh, ensure that they're safe, efficient, and reliable. The performance monitoring data platform is the same thing, but it is looking for trends, uh, to, you know, the negative trends that we want to um, improve and, and tweak operations. And the, the last platform, the um, regional multimodal travel information platform, is that is going to be in one of the, the next groups of, of priorities, uh, is pulling together the travel information that we have for all the different modes and all different sources. Uh, making it accessible in one place so that it's provided to the um, our travelers uh, to be able to make better mobility decisions. So to finish off the set of initiatives that we have here, we, the, uh, the evacuation planning, continuity of operations plans are um, a direct response to the uh, Marshall Fire that we had at the end of 2021. Uh, the, the rest of, of, of these are focusing on integrating the traveler information uh, from the different modes and different sources to be able to uh, pull it together into one place. And then the safety uh, technology um, applications, uh, you know, there could be uh, systems or uh, technology in the field to support uh, the, the staff in the field and uh, be able to uh, provide greater awareness to the both travelers and the operators on what's going on in the, in the region. So we'll just point out here, this is a new slide that wasn't in the packet. Uh, the packet went out before last week's um, uh, introduction to the board, and at that board there was some input provided. So I wanted to highlight that the, uh, our response to that input is that we uh, revise the order of the objectives that are listed in Table 2 of the document. I think it's page 6. Um, but no content was changed, just the order of the objectives that, uh, that are related there. So the proposed motion I put up there acknowledges this small change to Table 2. Uh, but other than that, that's my quick summary of the, uh, the document that I'm looking to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Discussion? McKinnon? I'd like to. Someone behind. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Greg, is, I, I, I wasn't able to attend last month. I was out of town. Um, and I don't know that we talked about the annual funding of 16 million, or I'm sorry, the four year funding for 16 million. That seems to have been the number that we've had for the previous cycle and maybe even prior to that. Is that, is that enough? No, it's never enough. Well, you know, I, I knew that. that was an easy one. I knew that one. Well, I mean, it, it seems that we've, it's a pretty flat program. I mean, can you see where we ought to be advocating for additional funding or, or would it be able to move some of your secondary and tertiary initiatives forward? Uh, I agree that the, you know, it could um, it could always benefit from more funding, 
and it is something from the Mobility Choice Blueprint that was identified, you know, looking for more funding to apply to technology. Um, but, you know, the, the TIP, um, uh, TIP policy development process goes through and, and identifies, you know, here are the set-asides and how much we're going to allocate, and that's what the program has got. Um, I think that you're bringing attention to something in, in the next TIP policy uh, uh, process. Uh, maybe some more attention should be placed on that. Um, that's, those are the funds that we're dealing with with this, this round. Thanks for that answer. Um, in, your, in the last uh, priority initiative, you spoke about transit coordination procedures. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, we should do this, we should do that, and then it looks for uh, implementation funding to do those things. And so that's one question. Second question, how does it relate to our regional BRT program? So the uh, regional BRT program uh, will rely on transit signal priority uh, to uh, assist the, the vehicles getting through the intersections with uh, less delay, uh, and also identified in um, the mobility choice blueprint of, of looking for more corridors to have transit signal priority. Uh, so that is that um, initiative is in support of that growth because currently the operations of the, the, tran the transit data and the traffic signal data are separate. And it's a manual process to do any evaluation to ensure that it's operating properly, one, and if there's anything that we can do to improve it. So uh, there is work going on right now with our uh, regional transportation operations and technology funding that is making those improvements where they're going to be integrating the data into a, a data set that's available uh, in a cloud instance. And so we can uh, do analysis more easily and reliably through that. Do you have a, could you say the time frame would be over the next X number of years for something like that? I'm hoping it's quicker than that. Uh, RTD has the funds. They have their contractor on board. I think the kickoff is happening in the next couple months. So I'm thinking in a period of six months, but I don't want to put uh, RTD under the gun uh, with not knowing specifically what their schedule is. But the, the, the project is initiating currently. That, that's encouraging. And just one final thing, Mr. Chair. Um, if, if we could ask... Uh, Mr. Rieger and Mr. Papsdorf, if, if we might be able to engage in that sort of conversation for additional funding, if necessary, in the next cycle. Oh, Jacob was giving. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair. Um, uh, Rick, so the allocations to the set aside programs is one of those items during the development of the TIP policy process that does come through TAC and then RTC and the board. Um, so you all had a view of that. I, your point is well taken. Um, as you all know, there's never enough money to invest in everything that we need to invest in in the region, but it's, a, it's an appropriate question and an appropriate conversation to have as we approach the next TIP cycle to think about is it time to strategically address the funding level for this particular set-aside program in the context of other regional needs. That's important. I think the other thing is it will be helpful now having this strategic plan in place to help shape that conversation about, okay, what are the initiatives, what are the priorities, and what might be the investments necessary to make progress towards achieving those outcomes that are laid out in this, this updated strategic plan to inform that discussion and get to sort of an appropriate funding level within all of the constraints that we have and against the priorities that we have. Chair, there's a hand up behind you. Thank Uh, yes, I am uh, promoting that. 
what, what you've identified is true. There is conflict at the intersections. That's why there are signals there to uh, be able to allow safe movement through, through the intersections. Uh, as um, some Vision Zero applications are put in place, it may change how the intersection operates. So it should be reviewed of, of like how does that impact operations. In terms of the efficiency from a quarter basis that I was talking about, uh, the operators have to work within the constraints of the physical environment. We can't, we have to deal with what's there. So if, uh, if there are different ra radius uh, applications to slow down vehicles at, at the corners, if uh, lanes are taken away, that just has to be accommodated by the operations folks. They're not driving those decisions in division, uh, division zero, but reacting to them to make sure that they're working uh, as efficiently as possible with the environment that's provided. Uh, so what I hear is that there, you have some ideas on how to change the signal operations to meet the, con meet the context of the environment, and uh, I agree. Uh, we provide services for traffic signal timing, so we have familiarity with that. The operators would say, well, these are important things to address in the signal timing plan, um, but if we, even if we're not involved, those are things that the operators and, and planners uh, should be uh, bringing into the, the process. Um, uh, we, from a technology standpoint, there is an ongoing Denver project that is uh, using passive pedestrian um, um, detection to be able to do uh, pedestrian controlled phases, both uh, calling up the phase in the first place before crossing, but also identifying that the, hey, the, the, the crosswalk isn't clear yet. Uh, we need to extend the, the phase to allow someone to clear. So those, those are part of the whole in which we're talking about here. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And if I could, the last couple of questions I think illustrate a larger theme that I want to emphasize a little bit, which is the idea of plan integration. You know, none of the work we do, whether it's the RTO and T plan, our taking action on Regional Vision Zero, our BRT network, our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, We've been working really hard over the years at Dr. Cog to really integrate all of those planning efforts together. Um, these things are not siloed, and in fact, uh, we take great care when we're working on a particular topic or a particular plan to make sure that it's integrated within our larger planning framework and some of those mode-specific or topic-specific plans that we have. So I think the last couple of questions do a good job of illustrating those points, but I wanted to provide that larger framework of how we're approaching as a staff these complicated, larger, multimodal issues. Um, any other questions? I'd write. Thanks. It looks like uh, Dr. Cog is tracking the number of signals with transit signal priority in the plan. Uh, it mentions 18 in operation and another 72 under development. I'm just wondering, in the next iteration of this, is it possible to get a map of those in addition to all the other maps that are included in the plan? Um, when you're saying the next iteration, the, the plan that is going to be going to the RTC? Uh, either that or the next time it's updated, just wondering if it's possible to, to track visually the, the sig transit signal priority. Um, yes, the next time it's updated, it can certainly do that. It would be a more significant network to show. Uh, currently, it, it would have been lost in the road network. Other questions? I'd like to. Motion. I move to recommend to the transportation attached regional transportation operations and technology strategic plan with the minor changes order of objectives in table two. Second. Mormon. Uh, second, Kent Mormon. Um, any other discussion on the item before we vote? Then we will uh, all the
those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Any abstentions, which I didn't ask last. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. move on to the next item then. Uh, federal performance measures targets presented by Alvin Bedal Sanchez. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you all can hear me okay. Um, so as introduced, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, I'll be discussing our federal performance measures. It is a hefty presentation today. We're discussing three performance areas that we have. So PM1 safety, PM2 infrastructure condition, and PM3 system performance. Uh, throughout the presentation, I'll give you a quick refresher on what each of these covers, what data we're looking at, what period we're looking at, some of the rationale we're looking at for why those targets are being set. Um, but uh, we'll start off with safety. Since it's the one we're most familiar with as an agency, we set these every year. It is a five-year reporting annual rolling average, so this is actually going to be the sixth time we set these targets. Uh, on your screen right now is a quick snapshot of our progress in achieving those safety targets. Um, while it is 2023, we are still waiting on data from CDOT for 2021, so right now it still is just an estimate for how uh, we're looking for those five performance, measure er for performance measures for the region. Um, for all of them, we would like to see a desired trend of decreasing, so decreasing fatalities, serious injuries, and non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Like I mentioned, we set these every year. They apply to data that's from all public roads in the region. There are five measures, the number and rate of fatalities, number and rate of serious injuries, and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Um, Federal guidance says these should be realistic, achievable, not aspirational, but we have pegged these to our taking action on regional Vision Zero plan, so achieving Vision Zero by 2040 or 2045, depending on the performance measure. Uh, and there is no penalty to Dr. Cog in terms of a financial penalty or uh, financing restrictions, uh, but we, will, we can expect additional scrutiny in our planning process the next time we have our four-year certification with our federal partners. Beyond our safety targets, we're also taking actions just as staff to improve safety in the region. Uh, on your screen now is just a slide of various initiatives that staff are leading or involved in. A couple that I'll highlight are staff are currently exploring an update to taking action on regional vision zero this year. Um, we've updated our number of projects and the number of funding in the current 2022-2025 TIP that are projects that improve safety. Um, our staff members are involved on multiple corridor safety studies. We're exploring a regional crash data consortium, as many of y'all are aware. And then this year, we're also part of a pilot program and a peer exchange across the nation with other uh, MPOs. Getting into the actual target setting process, I'll start with the number of fatalities. So through board guidance, we would like to achieve zero fatalities by 2040. Um, the light blue line is that trend when we started that decision-making process to get to zero by 2040 from where we were in 2020, 2019. Um, so the targets take a five-year rolling average, so we're looking from 2019 through 2023. Uh, 2019 to 2020 are observed data. What do we actually see in the region for those years? And then 21 through 23 are the trend projection forecast that we're looking to achieve using the average yearly reduction it would take to get to zero by 2040. So 2019 through 2023 added up divided by five gets you our five-year rolling average target for number of fatalities. These graphs are situated similarly, so uh, in this case, we're looking at serious injuries. Um, the goal would be zero serious injuries by 2045. Uh, in this case, we are um, recognizing that there was a significant drop in significant injuries in serious injuries in the region, but we are still using those trend line values for the remaining five-year calculation. So still using those 2019-2020 observed values and then forecasting out using that previous trend line that we had established uh, back in 2019 with the board for 2045. And then the last graph I'll show you related to this is non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. This was, is based also off the same methodology as serious injuries. And so what did we see in 2019 and 2020? What are we forecasting in 21 through 23 based on our previous projection line for average yearly reduction? And then adding those up, dividing by five to get you that five-year rolling average for number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. If you'll recall, there are five performance measures under this piece. Um, there are two rate targets, so those just take into account the uh, vehicle miles traveled, 100 million vehicle miles traveled that were experienced in the region. So those are also on your screen for transparency. 
Um, before I move into a different performance area, I will pause between sections if there are any quick questions. Mr. Pilgrim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, um, <clears throat> I don't know if, if you all have been alarmed at the number of, I, I'll, I'll just speak to the bicyclists who've been killed this month, well, in December into this year. Um, just Googling it before I came in, you know, uh, to the meeting, I think there are five, five bicyclists who were killed uh, in the metro area in the month of December, and there, there was one just recently in January, so I threw that one in. Um, and there was a settlement in Jefferson County, $33 million to the family of the bicyclist who was killed by an um, impaired driver. So... Um, now, I kind of lump the non-motorized all together in one thing, uh, bicycles and pedestrians um, injured and, and, and fatal. I, I wonder if we might, would we, would we make any better progress if we highlight those numbers instead of aggregate them? Yeah, um, I'll start off. Um, the the reason we're lumping non-motorized uh, in this piece together is just that's part of our federal requirements. But in terms of taking action on Regional Vision Zero, that plan update does provide um, those modal statistics. And so uh, we can look as we as staff explores that update, how can we be more more um, attentive, um, intentional about uh, breaking out those modal specifics and talking about those those different modes. As needed. Um, under non-motorized, it's a very large term, so it's not just bikes, it's peds, it's folk who are using a skateboard, who's in a wheelchair. Um, even a motorized toy car is considered a non-motorized uh, fatality or serious injury. So it is, you're correct, a very large uh, umbrella for what could be some distinct modal. Uh, and and thank you for that explanation. I, and I, I think it's incumbent um, on, on us in, in the agency and infrastructure programs to bring highlights to that. Um, it isn't always just the person that runs into somebody. It's also the person that could wear a more reflective vest or, you know, a light or something. Um, and I, I'm just, I don't know that there's enough attention that's brought to that. And, and <laughs> our, our curves are kind of alarming. Um, so I, I think if, more in that area, uh, and it might be that we highlight the specifics rather than the aggregate. Thank you. Jacob has a response. Yeah, just thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, just to tag on to what Alvin said, Rick, and everyone, just to be clear, yes, we are alarmed by those statistics. Uh, we're alarmed by those vulnerable user statistics. Um, I just saw today CDOT release the totals for last year. Total fatalities, I believe it was 745. I believe that was a record since 1981 or something close to that. I mean, regardless, any, any number above zero is just too much. It's just we are alarmed by it. Regardless of how the federal regulations have us package, this data we do track as best we can by individual modes, and our work at Dr. Cog is organized around doing whatever we can, regardless of the mode, but paying attention to individual modes, particularly those vulnerable users who are disproportionately represented in our crash data. Over the next couple months or so, we are planning on bringing a proposed update uh, to our regional Vision Zero plan, um, this and other issues, but this is definitely on our radar screen, and I appreciate you raising it. The follow-up to that, Jacob, I just wanted to mention, um, you said, you know, nothing about We always call these targets. I'm wondering if there's a better term for when we're talking, once we get into infrastructure condition, targets is a great, great word, but here it seems, it seems inappropriate in some ways to target 250 six people dying. So is there a way to call it limits or some other word? Maybe there's a mother nature out there that would be better, but that one just kind of always has bothered me since we started doing this, but just wondering if there's any other. I'll just leave that out there for now. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Mr. Vice Chair. Just to be clear, we're using the language that comes from the federal regulations around 
um, this work. It's Transportation Performance Management, or TPM, um, and the feds are very clear around kind of what we call things in that context. But in the larger holistic sense, the point that you're raising is that, yes, we have our own sort of performance work at Dr. Cog. Recall from our MetroVision plan, our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. So we have things that are federally required, but we have the things that sort of we track um, as well. And through our taking action on Regional Vision Zero, we have committed um, to a zero target um, in our both our fatalities and serious injuries over time. Uh, while, yes, that will take some time, um, that is the ultimate commitment of this agency through our planning work. Are there any more comments for Mr. Sanchez? Okay, go ahead. Okay, there we go. Ah, now you can hear me. Um, so two things. Uh, I recently heard that Hoboken, New Jersey um, has successfully had zero desks for something like over three years. So I just want everyone in the room to hear that it's doable. Um, Hoboken is not some small little, little town. It's pretty significant. So that was really aspirational to me. Um, I do have a, a technical question. I know that the, like the State Highway Patrol actually will differentiate between an analog and an e-bike in an accident. However, when that data translates further up, the e-bikes actually get taken out because they don't get defined as a vulnerable road user by some federal um, requirements. And I'm just curious uh, how Dr. Cog is tracking e-bikes. Are they being tracked as vulnerable road user um, injuries and deaths, or are they getting uh, pulled out of that data set? Anybody know? Um, so we're actually going to have our Regional Vision Zero Safety Planner uh, respond to that. We're going to phone a friend on that one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just to let you know when we are looking – oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. I'm Emily Kleinfelter. Um, yes, I'm Dr. Cog Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner. Um, and to let you know that when we are doing any type of data analysis, we are unfortunately restrained to the data that we're provided from CDOT, um, which comes to the Department of Revenue, and so that data – is only going to tell us so much. And so if it is already coming from the resource and it's being, we, we don't know if it's an e-bike at that point. It's just going to be listed as a bike um, or as a non-motorized user. But when we are doing that analysis, um, yeah, we are definitely making sure to separate the types of vulnerable road users. But we unfortunately don't have the data to be able to differentiate if it's an e-bike or a regular analog bike. No, that's that's fine. Like all, you know, e-bikes and analog bikes. I just want to confirm that the data you're getting actually includes e-bikes, because some of the data distillation, because some federal, uh, the way some federal agencies look at e-bikes, they actually get pulled out of vulnerable users. Um, so just confirming that e-bikes are included in that data. I don't care that much if e-bikes and, and yeah. analog bikes. Okay, all right. Well, they definitely are being included. I would say the only reason it would be removed is if it is some sort of e-bike that is potentially like a, this is what I'm looking for. Um, it's been altered to have a type of motor that's going to be going um, way past the maximum that a normal e-bike. I mean, if it's an e-bike that is of the, turbo, the normal regulations, like level one to three, um, those are going to be listed as still a, just a bicycle or a non-motorized user within our crash data. Great. Thanks, Emily. You're welcome. Any other questions before we move on? Great. Thank you. All right. So our second area is going to be infrastructure condition. Um, there are two pieces to this pavement condition and bridge condition. Um, on your screen are those previous period targets. Um, as a MPO, Dr. Cog's only required to set four-year targets, so that's why you're only seeing four-year targets and not two years or four years. Um, depending on whether it's good or poor condition, the desired trend is either increasing or decreasing, um, and uh, a quick snapshot of how the state did in terms of meeting their performance targets, because Dr. Cog did just support the state's targets in this performance area. Um, for pavement condition, there are four performance measures. Uh, interstate pavements in good and poor condition, and then the percent of non-interstate national highway system pavements in good and poor condition. Like I mentioned, CDOT sets two-year and four-year targets. Dr. Hogg's only required to set four. Um, the calculation is based on the different condition rating for uh, roughness, cracking, rutting, or faulting. Um, and as with all of our federal performance areas, the feds encourage us to be realistic and achievable. Uh, and as with all of them, we can either support the state's targets or set our own. Um, 
we are proposing to support the state targets for the remaining ones that we're discussing today, so PM2 and PM3. Um, I show you this not to explain pavement condition, because I'm sure all of y'all could school me in that, but to show you that when it comes to ratings, there's good, fair, and poor conditions. There are only performance targets for good and poor. So uh, if you're looking at the charts, if you're looking at the graphs, you're wondering where is the rest of that data, we're probably falling in that fair range. So a significant uh, percentage of the facilities in our region actually fall within fair. So um, once we get to our charts, uh, you'll see where those fall. Um, just a visual representation of what pavement condition looks like within the MPO area of the Dr. Cog region. I will make the caveat that this is uh, more than just our national highway system. So if you're wondering, um, you're seeing roads that you know aren't on the NHS, that's why. Uh, but the point here, similar to the previous visual, is just that there is a significant amount of facilities within the region that uh, fall within the poor category. Um, that can oscillate between 50% um, to 30%, depending on which metric we're actually looking at. And then just some percentage values for interstate pavement condition within the MPO area. Um, the, our rated good has oscillated the last couple of years in the 30s. Um, and in terms of poor conditions, those haven't uh, inched above 1%. So uh, in this case, you're seeing almost 60% of the facil facilities in the Dr. Cog MPO area are in fair condition. And then similar bar chart for non-interstate national, national highway system pavement condition. Uh, again, in this case, almost 70% of facil facilities within our region are in the fair category. So those that we're not setting official targets for, but that we're still uh, seeing within the data and tracking. Then the second piece to infrastructure condition is bridge condition. Um, this is data that gets reported to the National Bridge Inventory. We again only set four-year targets. There's performance measures for good and poor condition. Uh, and this has just taken the uh, rating areas for deck, superstructure, substructure, and culvert. So any bridge on the National Highway System is captured in this data within our MPO area. Uh, in terms of what we are seeing within our area based on CDOT data, um, again, a significant portion, 50% of bridges within the region on the National Highway System are in fair condition, uh, and 40, almost 44% are in good condition. And then a visual representation of that, just similar with the pavement condition map. Again, uh, good and fair make up the majority of the facilities of bridges within the region on the National Highway System. Um, CDOT actually forecasts out infrastructure conditions, so they use their asset investment management system um, that takes into account anticipated budgets and um, what those budgets will achieve. Um, and so they're able to understand their return on investment, and this is how they uh, develop their two-year and four-year targets uh, and why we're proposing to set to support the state's targets when it comes to those four-year targets. Uh, and they have already taken action, so they've uh, adopted those infrastructure condition targets, it just falls to us now to make our own decision on whether we support the states or set our own for the region. So again, for transparency purposes, uh, our four-year proposed targets that support the state's targets, the desired trend for each of those, and again, just four years because we only have to support or adopt four years. Um, I'll again pause between this performance area before I jump into travel time reliability and freight reliability. Weimer. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a suggestion, as you're showing these graphs that are showing, I would suggest targets on the graphs. I think it tells the full story. Of thank you. Just another suggestion, uh, especially when you're showing this to the board, you might point out very specifically that that was through 20 data and probably some roads that the elected officials would argue are in poor or fair and not or not good or fair. So the data is a couple of years old. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and we do actually have 2021 data, so uh, this can be an improvement for uh, RTC and the board while still caveating that while we are in 2023, there still is just up to 2021 data. Thank you. And did you have a follow-up? Alvin, thank you very much. This is probably more of a question for CDOT than it is for you. Um, the, the interstate pavement condition, not non-interstate NHS pavement condition, holding fairly steady. I mean, there's some year-to-year -year variation. The bridge deck condition sees a pretty significant drop-off, and I'm wondering, Jessica, if um, 
have some thoughts on sort of what might be contributing to that? Do you see, is that sort of a, a near-term dip that you think some future planned investments are going to address, or is that something that you all are seeing potentially continuing into the future? Excellent question, and I love to talk about bridges. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking when you mentioned that the data might be about two years old, I'm not sure if this data reflects the I-70 uh, viaduct structures coming offline and being replaced with the new structures. So that did give us a, a little bit of a tick upward in the uh, debt condition. Additionally, currently under construction or under design, we have the Harlan structure that along I-70 in Harlan that's being replaced. We have I-70 32nd structure, which is being replaced. Those were both poor. Under design that just went out to add, we have I-70 Ward Road. That's a twin pair of structures. Those will be coming offline and going under construction soon. So we're ticking them off as quickly as we can. Region 1 is unique in that we have a 10-year plan light item that specifically calls out bridges. Um, <clears throat> and we're estimating, even with the way we're in the with the pace that we're taking the bad bridges, we call them bad bridges, offline, new ones are coming online. Um, but we have about a $500 million bridge need just in Region 1 for bad bridges. Uh, we have the I-270 structures. Those are eight structures total. Those are being planned to go um, be replaced within the next several years. So we're making strides to drive the number down, but it is, it's a challenge to keep up with it. Um, you know, a lot of these structures were constructed around, you know, 50, 40, 50 years ago, and so it just takes some time to work through them. Does that help? Questions? Back to you. All right, well, our final area, travel time reliability and freight reliability. There are two different metrics, just recognizing the uniqueness of freight travel. Um, this all falls under PM3 system performance. If you'll recall, we handled two of these last year. Um, so the ones before you are those remaining pieces that we have to set our targets for. So uh, person miles traveled on the interstate and non-interstate national highway system, and then the truck travel time reliability index, which measures freight reliability. Um, I include this just to show that while we don't have uh, specific performance plans or reports for travel time reliability, we are still within the same performance period, so 2022 to 2025. So for all of these, the state does have the option of revising their four-year target at the mid-year point. And if they do, and Dr. Cog has supported those, we will also then come before you back at the mid-year point to revise those as well. And then just how we did with the previous period supporting the state's targets, they did achieve all three. Uh, and so in this case, they were, were either better than the baseline or they met their target across uh, reliability for both just travel and freight. Travel time reliability, like I mentioned, is person miles traveled on the interstate and non-interstate national highway system. That calculation looks at travel time um, in terms of the 80th percentile travel time compared to the 50th percent travel time. Uh, and so One moment while we change out batteries. <laughs> You have any good transportation jokes while we wait? <laughs> no. Josh? I have no idea where y'all lost me, so um, two performance measures. Interstate, non-interstate, national highway system. Uh, we look at the 80th percentile travel time compared to the 50th percent travel percentile travel time. Um, after we do those calculations, uh, get that index, we look at uh, whether it was below 1.5 for various periods within the day. Uh, and if it's below 1.5, it's considered reliable. Um, as with all of them, we can set our own, support the state's targets, and they need to be realistic and achievable. Uh, for these, we are also supporting, proposing to support the state's four-year targets. Uh, in terms of travel time reliability, this graph is showing both interstate and non-interstate. So the uh, majority of person miles traveled in the region are considered reliable. 
Um, in 2020, we did see that increase to 85% on the interstate and 94% on the non-interstate national highway system. Um, but even before then, uh, two thirds to 80% of travel regarding person miles traveled within the region were considered reliable. Then, Alfran has a quick comment. On this one, Elvin, and maybe for the benefit of the group, it probably can feel a little strange that as traffic is increasing and we all experience some some more delay, like how can how can travel reliability travel time reliability be increasing? How can how can more of the more a higher percentage of the trips be more reliable? And it's a quirk, as I understand it, in the way that it's calculated. Um, if if you have more congestion sort of spreading throughout more of the day, sort of the, that, that ratio between sort of 80% of the trips being at a certain travel time to kind of 50% of the trips being at another travel time, that ratio that this, this calculation can lead you to a conclusion that trips are more reliable. But, all, but it's also can be true that at the same time, the level of congestion, the duration of congestion can be going up overall. Um, it's just that, that ratio calculation that sort of and lines. I probably missed some of that explanation, Elvin, and um, feel free to help out on that. No, I think that was, um, can you hear me? Uh, I think that was good. Um, part of this is also just uh, the period that we're looking at. So there are um, five, four? five different periods, so uh, morning peak, midday, afternoon peak, um, overnight, and then uh, weekends. So uh, freight and truck travel are taking all those into account and then just summing all those. Um, so uh, some of those smaller pieces, uh, daily pieces, are getting washed out within this just annualized index. Mr. Weimer, I had a question for you. Yeah, um, so I assume this is a metric that is provided to you by the federal government. Is that correct? Or is this so, a metric that you or Dr. Cog or CDOT shows? Uh, so the, the threshold for like reliable versus non-reliable is provided by the feds. And so anything below 1.5, according to them, is considered reliable. And that's the metric for reliability. And um, where I was going with that is in MetroVision, as I remember, have a goal of 1.3 back in what something was the, the goal. and are a little bit different in terms of the story we're trying to tell. So wondering if they're alignment of some sort. Just yeah. an observation. Thank you, Brian. It is a good point. They are different goals, um, different targets, different universe of things being measured, different methodology. They are actually pretty different. Just to be clear, the targets on all of this, not just this one, but everything Alvin's presented, the targets, the requirements, the methodology, and even in some cases, the data are all federally prescribed. That's not to minimize it. That's just simply to say that um, we have sort of less flexibility here on some of this. And if it seems overly complicated, it's just we're trying to follow the requirements as laid out to us in statute about what we're calculating and how we do it. And then, like I mentioned, freight reliability has its own reliability metric. Uh, in this case, it's the Truck Travel Time Reliability Index. We, again, only have to set four-year targets. Uh, and in this case, that percentile is the 95th percentile compared to the 50th percentile. Uh, and the federal definition for reliability under 1.5, uh, in terms of uh, data within the Dr. Cog region, we have uh, not been considered reliable for freight movement. Uh, and so that and the... Um, fact that this metric is only for the interstate system is one of the one one of the one reasons we're looking at uh, supporting the state's targets as well. So, um, CDOT also forecasts reliability for both these two metrics. Um, if you recognize any information on this slide, this was also presented last time. We took into account uh, excessive delay targets. Um, in this case, I would just note that they also are now including uh, historic system reliability data from the data set that we use. So um, using their predictive modeling tool to help out with these two-year and four-year targets as well. And then our proposed four-year targets, which are supporting the states, the desired trend for both of those, um, increasing reliability uh, in, in 
terms of the index, again, the lower the number, the better. So that's why you're seeing a, a decrease in that. We don't want a decreased reliability. We just want a decreased index. Um, we're coming before you today to start the approval process. Um, we hope to go before the RTC February 14th, the board February 15th to meet our deadline of February 27th in terms of our safety targets. And then the PM2 infrastructure condition and PM3 reliability targets are due March 30th to CDOT. So the motion to open up discussion and further questions is to move to recommend to the RTC adoption of the 2023 safety targets and four-year pavement condition, bridge condition, travel time reliability, and freight reliability targets for the Dr. Cog MPO area as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Just before we get into um, discussion and, and a motion on this, first, I just want to thank Alvin and the staff. As you can tell, this work is pretty complicated, um, so appreciate all the staff work that went into this. But I also want to acknowledge the partnership with CDOT. Um, a lot of this data, uh, some of the calculations come from CDOT. They are a very good partner in working with us on this. CDOT actually has a similar requirement. All MPOs across the country and state DOTs um, have to do this work. So even like with safety, where we end up setting our own targets, uh, we're still working in partnership with CDOT. And I want to acknowledge um, their, their support and their efforts on this as well. Thank you. Thank you. With that, does anyone want to make a motion or? I'll propose the motion as stated on the slide. Uh, is there any further discussion before we vote? Mr. Heidright? I have a question on slide 31 on the travel time reliability. Um, I was wondering if you could explain why taking the first one as an example, if we have a 85% baseline of person miles traveled that are reliable, why our four-year target is going down? Yep, so the desired trend um, to highlight that column first is just uh, when it comes time to actually see how we did over the previous four years, the federal partners will look at whether we were better than our baseline or better than our target. So that's the desired trend um, at a basic level. Um, but we do want, obviously, see that increased. Um, I'm actually going to ask our CDOT partner, who also um, is present, to just touch on uh, the, the, some of the rationale and methodology behind setting those four-year targets. But part of it is just being um, acknowledging the data and not being aspirational, so being realistic to the, the data and the forecast and the predictive modeling that we're seeing and what's realistic for the region. Before we go on, can we answer that question? Go ahead. I have a follow-up, Brian? Yeah, I have a, another question. My name is Jacob Kirshner. I'm the performance data manager at CDOT. So the reason that there is a decreasing target here is we used a predictive model. What that did is it looked at our historic data on travel um, liability. So what we had seen within the model is we ran it in 2021. So we did have some COVID impacts. With the large, significant reduce in VMT on the interstate. Can you just step a little closer to the mic, please? Oh. We can't hear you too With well. the uh, significant reduction in VMT on the interstate, we did actually have our predictive models indicate that reliability is actually going to decrease a little bit. It does show in the long term it will start to increase again, but for the uh, two- and four-year targets, we are seeing still our initial model saw that there would be still impacts from COVID on that. There is, however, if that turns out that the model uh, is incorrect on that, we do have the ability to um, revise those targets at the two-year period. Um, Mr. Weimer? Yeah, um, since this is a requirement nationally, I'm wondering if we can get data from a benchmarking perspective once we see everybody else submitted to see where we align with others throughout the nation. Is that a possibility? Let me attempt to answer that maybe with some help from my friends up front. Um, per the federal requirement, again, this is required nationally. And as I understand it, USDOT, once they get all of this information, they actually do roll it up into a report for Congress. So in that sense, over time, you can kind of see 
nationwide. I forget to what level they break it down by state or MPO, but they do roll up the data um, and you can kind of see that performance trend over time. That's the point of the Federal Transportation Performance Management Program. I will caution, however, that, and I'll use safety as an example, but it probably applies to any of this. Um, every place is starting from a different, you know, they're increasing when they want to decrease or they're decreasing le or they're increasing less than they otherwise would have increased or they're decreasing and they want to decrease more, you know, whatever it is, every place is a little bit different. So it can be a little bit difficult to compare across jurisdictions, but point taken and the point of the program is again to see nationally how, you know, how are we doing? Um, Jacob and Alvin, did I get that right? Yeah, um, and there are dashboards. Uh, CDOT has a dashboard as well as uh, Federal Highway and Federal Transit, so those could also be um, resources for the next presentation to show how we're, once this period targets have been set, um, seeing how we compare with other areas. So um, that can also just be uh, a suggested improvement for the next presentation as well. It's just noting those dashboards that do exist as a resource for folk uh, and for staff to check out. Any other questions? So we had a motion by Bill Soroy, a second by Deborah Basket. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. And those abstain? Motion passes. We'll move on to the information items. And that first one, the only one, is the fiscal year 2024-2025 Unified Planning Work Program, my favorite update. Um, Ron Pepsdorf and others. <laughs> Todd, thank you. Oh, please, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully that works. <laughs> Gosh. All right. I'm going to kick off this presentation and then hand off to Todd. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, did you say this is your favorite, the Unified Planning Work Program, the UPW? Um, since I've, yeah, since my career started here at Dr. Cog in the okay. early 90s, yeah. Fantastic. Um, it, it is a really important um, function and product that, that we uh, develop as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region. Uh, so we, we do want to talk to the TAC today a little bit about the development of the next Unified Planning Work Program. So uh, going to see so it. will advance. Don't pretty kind of know. It's hard to hear you, Ron, up there still right. with the microphone. I'm not sure. I'll try to get a little closer. Is that a little bit better? Thank you, sir. Okay. So we do want to talk a little bit about just give ground everyone in the Metropolitan Planning Organization MPO sort of overview as it relates to the things that we um, are responsible for um, leading and developing um, as an MPO for the Denver region. Uh, talk a little bit about an overview of the current Unified Planning Work Program. We're going to go through a little bit of an exercise with you to help inform sort of our prioritization and decisions that we'll make in terms of allocating resources to certain activities and tasks for the region for the next two-year period for 2024 and 2025, uh, and talk a little bit about the process that we'll undergo and the, and the next steps for that. So let's see. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these slides fairly quickly. I've got a couple of slides a little bit later on that will maybe distill this down a little bit. Uh, but the important thing to keep in mind is that as the designated MPO for the Denver urbanized region, that we are responsible for coordinating and leading this continuing cooperative and comprehensive performance-based uh, transportation planning process for the region. And there are a number of things that go into sort of what that, the products or that make up that planning process. One is our Metropolitan Transportation Plan better known here in this region as the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, so that's the Long Range Plan, and the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP. So Long Range Vision, Long Range uh, Priorities uh, for Investments and Improvements in the Transportation System to reach 
um, long-term objectives and outcomes, and the TIP, which is near-term specific investment strategies of, of funds, in, federal funds in particular, but all funds into regionally significant or major transportation improvements um, in the region. There's guidance uh, in terms of how we, per, how we conduct this process in terms of uh, participation and consultation with a variety of interest groups. The scope is defined and tells us that we have to consider and implement projects and strategies and services that address specific planning, what are called planning factors. And these planning factors are laid out in federal law. So this list exists now uh, as adopted by Congress and signed into law by the President in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was our most recent transportation reauthorization bill as well. So it lays out and specifies these planning factors. So law says that as the MPO, we have to incorporate these planning factors and address these planning factors in that planning process that we coordinate. However, it doesn't tell us how to address the planning factors. It doesn't tell us how much to address this planning factor versus this planning factor. That's where we've got some discretion as an MPO with all of you to think about what are the most important factors in this region and how might we address them through the Unified Planning Work Program and the work that we do as the MPO uh, to address these planning factors. Uh, we do have to provide that performance-based approach it has to be consistent with the intelligent transportation system architecture for the region, and we have to prepare a coordinated public transit and human services transportation plan for the region. So that's another required element of the planning process. The scope also has to identify and develop tasks in the UPWP and in the planning process to address federal emphasis areas. The emphasis areas are adopted by the US, the U.S. Department of Transportation sort of outside of statute. And, the, and this is where the Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration, FTA say, in addition to those planning factors that you have to address, here's some emphasis areas that we think are really important for you to consider and incorporate into your planning process at the region. Again, laying out sort of things that are important at the, at the administration level around air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, racial equity, complete streets, federal land management agencies, planning environmental linkages studies, or PELs. But again, the feds don't tell us how to address these emphasis areas, how to incorporate them into the work that we do and document in the Unified Planning Work Program. It says, these are just emphasis areas we want you to consider and incorporate into your plan. So we've got some flexibility about how do we address these, which ones are most important to us as a region, and how do we fold those into developing um, the Unified Planning Work Program. Um, a couple of other kind of laying out those required elements or activities that we have to undertake as the MPO, the congestion management process. You all have seen presentations from Robert Spots and others on our annual congestion report. That's part of our congestion, uh, pro congestion management process. So as a large MPO in the country, we, we are required to do that. I talked about the long range plan, the metropolitan uh, transportation plan, in our case, the regional transportation plan and the TIP. Uh, again, as required activities that we have to do. Uh, federal law lays out that the Unified Planning Work Program is one of those things that we have, have to do. So <coughs> as the designated MPO uh, for the region, um, we, get, uh, we are granted by the federal government certain funds, federal funds, to, to pay for to help us do this work. Um, and we document in the Unified Planning Work Program how we're going to spend those federal grant dollars that are granted to us as the MPO to carry out this planning work. So the UPWP both is really important to all of us collectively to say, hey, here are the issues we're going to address as an MPO with all of our partners, the state, the RTD, our, member govern our local member governments, to really address these planning issues in the region. And the UPWP just documents the expenditure of all of those federal funds that are allocated to us for those planning activities that we're gonna undertake as a region. The other thing though, is that it also has to capture sort of major significant <coughs> planning efforts that are going on in the region, regardless of who's paying for them. So we have to capture all the things that we're spending the federal planning funds on uh, in the UPWP as the MPO. But if, if Longmont is doing a significant sort of planning effort and they're using local funds, we also need to capture that planning work in the UPWP because it is a unified planning work program. It is not a Dr. Cog planning work program. Uh, so that's an important distinction as well. 
So I just want to sort of encapsulate that real quickly before I hand off to Todd to talk a little bit about an overview of the current UPWP to set the stage for sort of a little exercise we want to go through with you uh, this afternoon. So again, we have to operate and, that, and maintain that transportation planning process for the region with all of our partners. Um, a really important aspect of this and why this is important to all of us is not just addressing our transportation needs, but making sure as a region that we stay in compliance with federal law and regulations because there is a risk that if we don't do this right, if we don't do it well, we could be found to be out of compliance and all of us could become ineligible to receive and spend federal transportation dollars. Pretty low, pretty, that would be unlikely to happen, but that is a possible outcome if we really get out of compliance with federal law in this planning process. Again, we have to develop a unified planning work program to document our work uh, we have to develop a regional transportation plan. We have to do a transportation improvement program. We have to comply with and report on and adopt those transportation performance measures and targets, as you talked about earlier. Um, we have to do a congestion management process, and we play a really important role in the federal planning process around air quality conformity and our work to address the, the federal air quality standards. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that we do as an agency and collectively to support those things that we have to do. Right? So we collect and maintain and disseminate a lot of regional data that helps inform our planning processes, our collective planning processes. We do land use modeling and transportation modeling to help inform our planning decisions. And you know, so these are somewhat discretionary, but I'd be hard pressed to consider the fact that we could do good transportation modeling if we didn't do good land use modeling and forecasting about what the future looked like from a socioeconomic standpoint. So those are things that we that really are necessary to do um, to support the work that we have to do under federal law. We provide a lot of technical assistance to our partners. We do scenario planning, local transportation plan support. Uh, we run the traffic operations program and signal coordination. You heard about a portion of that uh, from uh, from the RTONT strategic plan uh, from Greg earlier. We do a transportation demand management program in this region and a regional traffic count program and database. So collecting, again, a lot of data, compiling that, making that available to all of our partners and as good information to inform our planning decisions. We think about sort of issues that are facing us sort of now, emerging issues, things we're thinking about in the future. So you know, we're, we're dipping our toes into quarter planning. You've heard a little bit about that, community-based transportation plans, greenhouse gas emissions, and the RTP review was a big effort last year under new state law, so emerging issues there. Housing and incorporating that more than we have in the past into our transportation process. There's new infrastructure investment and job, jobs act programs that we're keeping an eye on and will inform or might drive certain decisions and activities as we develop the next UPWP. Local transportation and land use best practices might be some new emerging issues in the future for us to think about to address and, and help us with a number of these issues. And last but certainly not least and foremost in our minds that Vision Zero and safety initiatives and continuing to try to address those issues and how do we do an be even better job of that in the next UPWP. And then there's a whole bunch of things that sort of keep us up at night and kind of keep us worried and we're thinking about sort of how, how will we address them, what these issues really are critical issues of facing the region that we should consider to help inform sort of our activities and tasks for the next two year UPWP. So we know the population continues to age, we know we're going to continue to have funding limitations, we know that transportation technology has the opportunity to really change the dynamics of the transportation system. One thing that I don't think is on here is sort of how sticky are some of the changes in travel behavior from the pandemic period going to continue to be going forward and how might that influence how we address transportation in this region. So just give you uh, some flavor of some of the things that sort of are on our minds and we're thinking about. So with that, I wanna hand over to Todd just to give you a quick overview of the current UPWP to sort of set the stage then for a little bit of an exercise with you. Thanks, Ron. So as you can tell, there is a method to our madness. So when we reach out to you, uh, it usually is on a very important topic. Most likely that is required, sometimes not. But again, information that we need to collect from you to help with our planning process. So the current UPWP is organized into seven different objectives, and we'll run through each one of those uh, individually. First is program administration and coordination. 
pretty self-explanatory. Uh, for us to administer the MPO transportation planning program, I think the most important takeaway here is really to maintain and update the UPWP, whether that is through amendments or through the development of a brand new document like we're just beginning to go through right now. Planning coordination and outreach. Uh, this really involves staff reaching out and working with the public. Um, in addition to the public, it also includes our partner agencies. So if we come to you uh, and seek certain information or if you make a request to us to speak at a certain event, that would be included in this planning coordination and outreach. Um, just a couple items. So public engagement plan would be one deliverable under this uh, objective, but it would also include the work that we conduct um, through our pub public hearing or our public outreach um, activities. Long range and multimodal planning. Um, title pretty much says it all, working with our region's long range plans um, in addition to those various modal plans. Um, so we're talking about MetroVision, the RTP, um, in addition to those active transportation, TDM, freight, corridor and community base, and complete streets planning. So trying to encompass those all up into one category or object objective. Project programming, um, or a more simplistic way to say this is the transportation improvement program objective, um, really looking at maintaining and updating the actual TIP and the TIP databases, um, most importantly holding those calls for projects. Transportation systems operations, um, really looking at those strategies to improve the safety and effectiveness of those existing transportation, uh, of the existing transportation system. Um, as Ron mentioned, this will include our congestion management process, um, also planning for ITS, security, safety, and innovative mobility. Public transportation planning or our transit, transit objective, looking at those uh, rapid transit corridors, regional bus network, in those transit facilities. And finally, we've kind of uh, wrapped it up into one single objective uh, about collecting and acquiring, maintaining that planning data and all the modeling data that goes with it. So travel and land use modeling, um, our regional data catalog, maintaining and updating that, uh, in addition to traffic counts, um, and then working with you to develop some data products. So, that is sort of a, a summary of how those seven objectives sort of fit into our one document. And with this, I will actually turn it over to Josh and we're gonna take you through a little bit of a Menti exercise. Thanks, Todd. So for those who haven't used Mentimeter in the past, um, you can use your phone uh, to access the QR code that you see up here, or you can type into your browser menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and then enter the code 3554-4189, and you'll have access uh, to this poll. Just have a quick couple questions. Um, as we've sort of outlined what our requirements are and what the current document has in it. We also want to get all of your feedback on uh, what we can take into account for the new document that we're developing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and change the slide, but the, where you see at the top where it says menti.com and the code, that will be at the top of the slide moving forward, so you can still get in if you aren't in just quite yet. All right, so as Ron uh, reviewed, we do have 10 federal planning factors that we are required to take into account, um, but they don't give us any direction in terms of the priorities for any of those, which ones we should focus most of our time on. So we wanted to put that out to all of you. What do you think are kind of the priorities for the region? Recognizing all 10 of these are important, otherwise our federal partners wouldn't have told us that we have to take them into account, uh, but perhaps some are more important for this region than others. Um, perhaps some are maybe going to take a little bit more time and energy to address than others. So um, just asking you to kind of put those into a ranking, um, give us some direction on what might your priorities be uh, for our time moving forward. And if anyone has any questions as to what is included in any of these, uh, feel free to ask. Um,
I see 15 responses so far. I'll maybe give a few more seconds before we move on. We're at 20, so I'm going to go ahead and change the slide. Still a few more coming in. <laughs> All right. Um, so similarly, we also have eight planning emphasis areas that we have to take into account. Same question back to you. Um, is there a priority for any of these? Um, which should we kind of prioritize for uh, for our time moving forward, um, again, if there are questions on what is included in, in, in any of these, um, maybe a couple that might not be intuitive, strategic highway network, that is uh, coordination with the U.S. Department of Defense on kind of military access to military facilities, uh, federal land management agencies' access to obviously federal lands, so national park, um, national wildlife refuge, uh, areas like that. I think we're seeing similar themes on this as the last one where complete streets um, and safety on the last one had kind of filtered to the top. I'll give it a few more seconds. I think we were at 25 last time, so I will change the slide. Oh. <laughs> as soon as I say it. <laughs> All right. Um, so now just kind of an open-ended question to all of you. Are there transportation-related issues that your specific community is facing that you think Dr. Cog would be well-suited to assist with? Are there, are there issues that you're facing in your community that maybe are best addressed at a regional level? Um, so it's, it's open-ended. You can submit any thoughts you have. Um, but are there, are there issues that you would like to see addressed in our next UPWP, I guess would be another way to phrase it. Transit, vision zero, options for older adults. And it certainly can be something that we are currently taking into account that you want to uh, make sure we continue to take into account in the future. Rural linkages, technology communications, corridor planning, affordable housing. Again, I'll give a couple seconds before switching to our last question. We've got 20 responses. Airport access, bike and ped. All right, so I'll go ahead and switch to our last slide. Um, and this is essentially the same question, but are there issues facing the region as a whole? Maybe not, not your specific community, but that's facing all of us together as a region. Um, might be very similar to what you submitted in the last one. Um, the congestion, growth management, and the climate crisis related GHGs. funding, and lack thereof, modal shifts, okay. Commuter choices and related to that, hybrid work options. Give maybe a few more seconds on this one. Quality of life. 
camp in the private sector. So I'll go ahead and wrap up this slide, but thank you all for all of your input. Um, this will all be provided back to staff. Staff is currently working on uh, discussions around developing the new tasks and deliverables for the UPWP. Um, so all of this feedback will be provided back to them um, so that they can take that into account as they're developing um, those new revised tasks and deliverables lists. Um, so just a few notes on kind of next steps. Um, at your March meeting, we intend to come back to you with a draft list of tasks and deliverables based on uh, what staff what staff develops with this feedback um, and kind of what the major activities that we anticipate taking on over the next two years might be. Um, in June, uh, we'll have the draft document available for a 30-day public comment period. Um, and following that, we will come back to you at your July meeting uh, to ask for your recommendation on the document and then move forward with RTP and board uh, anticipated action in August. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for your time and for your feedback. If you have any questions, Ron's name is on the screen, so I think you can <laughs> ask him. <laughs> did you have any follow-up? I, I, did, I, did I did a poor job of quality control on the slide deck <laughs> to leave my name on there. Um, I, I just uh, thank you, Josh, very much for that wrap-up and going through that exercise. I hope you all found that helpful. It's informative to us as we sort of do a prioritization and figure out what, what we think we you'll have another bite at this apple. We'll also be going through a similar exercise with the Regional Transportation and our board. Um, so they'll, they'll have some input into this process as well. Um, I think the other thing we didn't put on Next Steps, Josh, is we'll also be reaching out to all of our partners asking for information about those sort of non-Dr. Cog-led major planning activities that any of you anticipate occurring within, within 2024 and 2025 that we need to incorporate into the unified planning. Weimer, what would be the time frame for that need for information? And I believe I've seen it. Oh. <laughs> I believe we're currently looking to reach out in the March, April timeframe. Um, we'll probably provide maybe three to four weeks, uh, maybe, maybe two to three weeks of time uh, for you to respond. Um, but we'll, we'll send it out to everyone, um, essentially just asking what those major planning initiatives that you might have are that are not either already captured in the UPWP or through the TIP. And it's, and it's not a constraining process. So it's kind of what you best can anticipate occurring sort of as of now. If a major activity sort of gets kicked off that you didn't anticipate kind of during that time period of the of the 24 and 25 UPWP, we'll just need to amend that into the UPWP to our amendment process. But we do review and amend, not just a one. Any other questions for the group? Not, we'll move on to member comments and other matters. The AMP working group update from Carson Priest. Hey, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I usually do not have an update. We did not have a meeting in January. I'll have one in February. Okay, thank you. Are there any other updates from other members? Yes, Rachel. Is that working? Okay. <laughs> my first time using a microphone. Um, I just want to uh, invite everybody, if you haven't already, uh, consider joining us at Moving People Forward. It's Bicycle Colorado's annual mobility conference. I'm really excited that many people in this room are actually uh, presenting panelists, moderators, um, but would love to see all of you there. We've got some really inspiring national thought leaders in um, the areas that I know we all care about including um, Charles Brown, who is really w widely recognized for being, I think, one of the nation's leading voices on transportation equity. And then um, I'm also really excited that Lynn uh, Peterson will be part of it. And she is also a nationally recognized champion for transportation and land use uh, integration and really looks at uh, historical disparities in transportation investments. So we've got some uh, inspiring, inspiring folks, but a lot of your peers are going to be in the room, and it's a great networking opportunity, and we'd love to see everybody there. And uh, we only have about 40 registration slots still available. So if you're interested, 
jump on it. You can just go to Bicycle Colorado's webpage or email me and I'd be happy to connect you with registration. And bring your whole team. Thank you. Are there any other updates from other members? If not, we'll move to staff. They have some updates. Bill, so just, just one reminder for the group. I think back in December when the latest notice of funding opportunity for the RAISE grant program was announced, uh, as has become routine for us, we sent out a form. We're asking for just some basic information from any agency partners who may be considering submitting an application for a RAISE grant this cycle to please get that form to us by February 16th. Uh, in time for us just to share out for information purposes with all the partners in the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, packet and meeting at the February 27th meeting. Is that the 27th right date? Yeah. Uh, so just a reminder, um, if you're thinking about that, please get that to us. It really helps, I think, all of us to understand sort of what folks are doing. It also is really important to us and for all of your partners. If you're asking Dr. Cog or other partners to provide letters of support for your grant application, it just, I think, is a matter of transparency and openness. And so everyone knows it also is an opportunity to highlight kind of where there might be um, opportunities to partner or collaborate on issues. This one is a little bit late because that TAC meeting is the day before those applications are due. So if you are thinking about something, it probably behooves you to sort of get information out, talk to, talk to your neighboring jurisdictions or other partners uh, sooner rather than later. And then one other reminder, you all are working hard on your tip call number four, sub-regional applications. Those are due on Friday, correct, Josh? Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for Ron. Um, so I know that uh, last year it was just like a crazy storm of uh, funding notices as we, everyone was trying to figure out what the IAJ was and what these look like. Um, is there any way to figure out what the calendar of releases for this year? And if so, is that something Dr. Cog could could get out so that uh, we can be less reactive and, and more, uh, more on the planning side because we all like planning? Yes, and we're ha we'll, ha we'll we can send out a link to, to our distribution list um, to a resource on the U.S. Department of Transportation website. Um, they issued a schedule last year, too. Um, so doesn't always help us avoid surprises. Um, they, I think they try to hold to a pretty that schedule, but we've seen sort of some some deviation from what they've what they've put out. But yes, we. There, there is, there are resources, and there is information provided on the U.S. Department of Transportation website. We'll share that out with everyone. The link to that site right, where they have sort of where they anticipate. They often don't add NOFOs to that calendar or list um, until fairly shortly before they actually issue the NOFO. It's not always an exhaustive list. So, with that caution, um, we'll gladly share out that information. That's everything. I will. Call the meeting adjourned at 3.03. Thank you.